The Director Series is made possible in large part by our generous supporters on Patreon. Please visit us at patreon.com backslash director series to see how your contribution enables the continued production of video essays and text articles on your favorite contemporary and classic film directors. Thank you. First impressions are everything. That old adage is true enough in the real world, but it's especially true in the world of cinema. Chances are, if the first film an average moviegoer sees from a given director leaves a bad taste in one's mouth, there won't be much eagerness to see that director's work in the future. Some even take their criticism to a personal level, dismissing the director outright on the grounds of his or her artistic character. As is the case with all forms of art, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and few filmmakers are able to imbue their work with the sort of ethereal, ephemeral beauty that director Sofia Coppola does on a regular basis. From her 1999 debut, The Virgin Suicides, on through to her latest release, Coppola's films boast a deftness of touch and a subdued grace, elusive qualities that become all the more resonant in our increasingly mechanized and hyper-connected world. Like any artist who puts forth a stream of work for our consumption, especially one who is utterly uninterested in catering to as wide an audience as possible, Coppola has her fair share of detractors and naysayers. The highest profile, and perhaps maybe the most cutting, of these criticisms is the charge of nepotism frequently leveled against her. Nepotism courses through nearly every profession, naturally, but it's an especially visible phenomenon in Hollywood. After all, when you live in a town where a key barrier to success is who you know, having legendary New Hollywood auteur Francis Ford Coppola as your father admittedly gives you a pretty serious leg up over the competition. The film industry is full of overprivileged and under-talented royalty who merit actual charges of nepotism, but the Coppola clan proves the exception to the rule. From immediate offspring like Sophia, her brother Roman, and her niece Gia, to extended family members like cousins Nicolas Cage and Jason Schwartzman, cinematic excellence clearly runs through the Coppola bloodline. Sophia has had a particularly steeper uphill climb than her kin. Not only does she have to surmount the whispers of nepotism that dogged her early endeavors, but, as a woman, she also had to overcome the inherent challenge of simply breaking into a profession dominated almost exclusively by men. Case in point, she was only the third woman in nine decades of Oscar history to be nominated for Best Director. Her admittedly privileged upbringing has nevertheless given her a unique, well-traveled worldview, one that her critics find to be uncompelling at best and hopelessly out of touch at worst. It's easy to dismiss her films as a series of melancholy, navel-gazing portraits about the white leisure class, but look again, and one might instead see a biting self-awareness that adds layers of subtle nuance and humanizing depth. Over the course of six sublimely moody features and counting, Sofia Coppola has continually proven her filmmaking bona fides with her own distinct stamp, and has stepped out from under the overbearing shadow of her father's legendary career to forge a path all her own. Born in New York City on May 14, 1971, Sophia was the youngest child of Eleanor and Francis Ford Coppola, who at the time was preparing to direct The Godfather, the film that would form the foundation of his legacy as a key figurehead in the new Hollywood movement of 1970s American cinema. Sophia quickly earned herself a role as a figurehead for Generation X, involving herself with film and fashion at an exceedingly early age. She made her film debut after her birth, standing in for Michael Corleone's infant son during The Godfather's iconic baptism scene. Her childhood was well-traveled, accompanying her father on Francis's film shoots around the world, including a long stretch in the Philippines during the grueling production of 1979's Apocalypse Now. As she grew into her own during the 1980s, she cultivated an acting career by appearing in several of her father's films from that decade, The Outsiders, Rumblefish, The Cotton Club, and Peggy Sue Got Married. She even appeared in Tim Burton's 1984 short Frankenweenie under the name Domino, at 15, she interned at Chanel, exploring what would become a lifelong interest in fashion. 1989 saw her professional writing debut, having collaborated with her father on the script for Life Without Zoe, a short film contained within the larger omnibus feature New York Stories. Following her graduation from St. Helena High School in New York, she moved to Oakland, California to attend Mills College. She would transfer to Cal Arts in Valencia before dropping out altogether, choosing instead to start a fashion line called MilkFed, which is still sold exclusively in Japan. After her disastrous, Razzie award-winning supporting performance in The Godfather Part Three, Coppola abandoned her budding acting career altogether, in favor of stepping behind the camera to make her own films.
Coppola's first official credit as a director is for a music video, a format that served as the entry point into the industry for many members of her generation. Created to promote Walt Mink's 1993 track Shine, the video marks the first appearance of several themes and images that would come to define Coppola's distinct aesthetic. Shine seems to foreshadow the central approach Coppola would take for her 1999 debut feature The Virgin Suicides, a dreamy, navel-gazing ambiance with a pastel color palette and a warm, summery setting. The piece is a fairly conventional performance video, intercut with handheld footage of teenagers napping in the grass and swimming in the pool. Coppola depicts a world she knows quite well, one of suburban privilege and leisure. A simple concept with little structural shape to speak of, Shine nonetheless hints at the artistic style Coppola would come to be known for, an observational and nostalgic gaze spiked with a punk edge. Coppola's second music video for the Flaming Lips' This Here Giraffe further embraces the rough-hewn punk inclinations of its predecessor. She again adopts a loose cinema verite approach that utilizes handheld photography to capture fleeting moments instead of staged setups, while embracing the imperfections of the format by keeping in light leaks and other filmic aberrations. When combined with the punches of bright pastel colors dotting the otherwise monochromatic blue-collar suburban environs, the overall effect reads as an avant-garde twist on the mundane. The video, which also delightfully features literal giraffes, further explores Coppola's ascetic interest with the iconography of suburbia as perceived by the teenage girl. A substantial amount of attention is paid to what is undoubtedly an adolescent girl's bedroom, festooned with cats, rock band posters, and playful splashes of pink. Coppola's unpolished technique echoes the rough, crunchy quality of the Flaming Lips' track, making for an effortless match between sound and picture.